If I type your name in on Google, it says that Stephen C. Meyer is an American author and former educator. He is an advocate of the pseudoscience of intelligent design. And I just think that that's interesting right out of the gate. And I wanted to give you a chance to to respond to that idea. Why is it uh, referred to as a pseudoscience? Notice the term itself, pseudoscience, implies a definition of what presumably true science is. Um, and this is in the philosophy of science known as the demarcation problem. How do you define science and distinguish it from pseudoscience or philosophy or religion or metaphysics or something else? And it turns out that that's a very difficult thing to do because the methods of reasoning that are used in scientific disciplines are actually not dissimilar and in some cases are the, the same as uh, the methods of reasoning that are used in philosophy or metaphysics or uh, his, historical work or forensic inquiry. So the the term pseudoscience is obviously a pejorative. It's meant to stigmatize someone um, without actually engaging in the person's arguments. But the presumed definition of science that is uh, underlying that that term and its use in on the Wikipedia entry is that if you're to be a scientist, you must limit yourself to strictly materialistic explanations for everything. And you may not invoke intelligence or creative intelligence as a cause to explain anything. The reason they've designated me and other advocates of the theory of intelligent design as pseudoscientists is because they've presupposed a materialistic definition of science. The, the, the There's a term in the philosophy of science for that definition, it's called methodological naturalism or methodological materialism. And it is it is a claim that, again, a normative claim that if you're to be scientific, you must not consider creative intelligence as an explanation for any phenomena. If you do, then you're going outside the scientific method and you're pseudoscientific. Well, um, that's, that's a, 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 a contentious definition of science. There are many fields that we recognize as scientific that invoke creative intelligence. If you're an archaeologist and you look at the uh, the Rosetta Stone uh, in the British Museum, you're going to immediately infer that there was an intelligence involved in producing those inscriptions in three different languages. So we have methods by which we can detect the activity of intelligent agency. And what we're saying, what we that those of us who are proponents of intelligent design are saying is that when we apply those methods of design detection to living systems, we actually see distinctive hallmarks of the activity of of, of a designing mind that that is empirically detectable, and um, and so that that question can't really be settled. Whether we're right or wrong can't be settled by simply saying, "Oh, well, that's not scientific. We're not going to consider that." what really needs to be considered is whether or not the evidence supports the inference we're making. And this is the problem with all the, the use of demarcation arguments and why philosophers of science have generally rejected them. Um, you, if you want to define somebody's opinion out of existence by the use of some abstract definition, uh, or if you want to define a theory or a perspective or an inference or a, a, a hypothesis out of existence, or to say it can't be considered by definition, you may end up missing the the best explanation for the evidence because you're you've simply defined science too narrowly to exclude possibilities that uh, are inconsistent with your own personal philosophy. The philosophy in this case of materialism. Correct me if this is uh, not the most helpful way of narrowing down into this, but for me, this distinction between mechanism and agency, I find very interesting. And what I mean by that, for those who maybe are listening and don't know what I mean, is that when it comes to materialist explanations of the functions of the universe, it's like looking at a car engine and saying, how does everything work? What are the mechanics of how they all work? But when it comes to the question, the broader question of agency, it's more so the question of how do these pieces fit together and where do the raw materials themselves come from? And I think it was John Lennox who said that agency and mechanism don't compete with each other. I guess I want to say that just to, and again, if anything that I said well, in there... Let me make a little, yeah, l l give it a slightly different sure. framing. I think you're onto something very important. There's an analytical distinction there. If you look at the car engine, 
um, you you can evaluate, you can analyze how how it works, and there is a mechanism there, many mechanisms at work, um, and you can do that without without respect to agency. Uh, you know, the the pistons go up and down. They put, put uh, they cause the gases to combust. That causes uh, movement in the in the uh, axle, etc. And you can you can track all those different cause and effect relationships in in and describe them in, in strictly materialistic terms. But if you want to give an account of the origin of the mechanisms, the origin of the engine, you can't do that apart from the agency of the engineer. And so if you're asking questions about causal origins, um, as opposed to, if you ask questions about how does one part of the material the material world or the physical world interact with another, you're gonna, the, the framing of the question means that you're gonna give a materialistic answer. But if you have to ask a question about, well, what caused this entity or system or process to arise in the first place? It might be that it was the product of purely undirected material processes, but it might also be the the case that it was the product of an agent manipulating or designing or arranging material processes or material material entities. So agency may play a role. So if you ask what caused this thing to come into existence, one possible answer to that question is is a mind. Uh, Another is purely undirected material processes. If you define science in advance so narrowly as to exclude the possibility of mind, you might miss the right answer. You, mm. The evidence may be pointing in a blindingly obvious way to the activity of an intelligence, as it is with the Rosetta Stone, for example. Um, and if you insist, well, no, I, I can only invoke undirected material processes to answer that question of causal origins, then you you may end up saying something silly like, well, it looks like wind and erosion produce those inscriptions on the Rosetta Stone. And so when we see, for example, the the uh, the digital information stored in the DNA molecule and, and as scientists have elucidated what that information does, that it's part of a complex information storage, transmission and processing system. And we begin to think about, well, what in our experience produces information? What produces information processing systems? And we realize that there is only one known cause of that kind of effect. And that cause involves agency. It involves intelligence, conscious um, conscious activity. There's a great um, early information scientist who was at the forefront of applying informational analysis to molecular biology. And he said that the creation of new information is habitually associated, habitually associated with conscious activity. That's what we know from our uniform and repeated experience, which is the basis of all scientific reasoning. And so this gets back to your earlier question about the problem of labeling things pseudoscience or saying that mm -hmm. intelligent design is just not science or it's it's religion or it's metaphysics or it's you put a label on it and think you've answered the argument. But the 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 key question is, what is the best explanation of the evidence based on what we know about the cause and effect structure of the world? If we're asking a question about causal origins, we need to be open to the possibility of agency or intelligence as part or all of the answer. And we also need to be open to materialistic explanations as well. But defining science so it's it's limited to materialistic explanations means that you may not you may make an inference to the best materialistic explanation, which is not the best explanation, in fact. What are the different explanatory options for the origin of the universe? And why do you think that intelligence or an intelligent designer is the more reasonable option? Well, I'd frame that um, issue. Well, that, that's fine. Let's let's dive in on that. As we all know, debt doesn't just show up one day, right? It grows little by little, like a mold, insidious and damp, credit cards, car loans, medical bills, and then suddenly you're juggling payments and you are stuck. But here's the good news. You're not actually stuck. You just need a reset. You just need a strategy. You just need some people to come alongside you and help you manage the current situation. So that is why I'm introducing you to American Financing because they help homeowners like you every day. They use your home's equity and roll the high interest debt that you have into one simple affordable payment. They're saving homeowners an average of $800 a month. There's no judgment, no pressure. They just have a real solution that helps put you back in control of your finances again so that you can 
breathe again, sleep again, and start thinking about the future again. It starts with one call. It only takes 10 minutes to get started, and there are no upfront fees, by the way, so it costs nothing to find out how much you can actually save with this solution. Also, if it makes sense to do and you're in a dire strait, you may be able to delay your next few mortgage payments to get back on a secure foundation. American financing salary-based consultants are ready to listen, ready to help, so take back your peace of mind with American financing today. Call American financing today at 866-889-5154. That's 866-889-5154. Or go to AmericanFinancing.net slash wisdom. The, um, the first, the conference, it was early in my career. It was a conference that was discussing these three big issues at the intersection of science and philosophy or science and religion. Uh, the question of the origin of the universe was the first uh, issue up. And the conference was divided, interestingly, between very elite scientists who were either theists or materialists. And they were debating, well, what does our best evidence about the origin of the universe or the origin of life imply as to which of these different, uh, these two competing philosophical systems of thought is the better one to hold? Which one provides a better explanation or provides a better a sense of coherence to the data. And in the first session, the great uh, American uh, astrophysicist uh, and astronomer, Alan Sandage, ascended to the podium and surprised many people in the audience by sitting down on the theistic side of the panel. Hmm. And it turns out that he had been a long, he was a, an agnostic Jew, who was a well-known scientific agno uh, scientific materialist, fairly hard-bitten scientific materialist through much of his career. He had been Edwin Hubble's PhD student. He was a grad student of Hubble's. And he had been for a couple of decades involved in um, verifying the expansion of the universe in all, all quadrants of the night sky. And so in his talk, he gave a talk about the evidence for what we now call the Big Bang Theory and the evidence that the universe had a beginning and reflected on that evidence rather poignantly, uh, pointing out that the evidence we have for a beginning from multiple, and there are multiple lines of such evidence, suggested that the material universe itself had a beginning before which there was no matter to do the causing. If matter itself comes into existence at a finite time ago, then positing a prior material state to explain the origin of matter is self-contradictory. And instead he said, you know, what we're looking at, he said, here is evidence for what can only be called a super natural event. And there was a beat between the word super and natural. Mm -hmm. And he was, you know, kind of, he then went on to reflect on this um, and it announced that he had had a religious conversion and that the scientific evidence about the beginning of the universe, about the fine tuning of the universe and some other things actually were influences in his coming to theistic belief. It was not because of, but it was not in spite of these evidences. It was in, in part because of them. He also realized there was something inside himself, which he described very, again, poignantly uh, that was reluctant to, to consider the possibility of a transcendent intelligence as the cause of the universe. But then he realized it might be the better explanation. So why am I so resistant to this? It was a fascinating discussion. Anyway, the there are different there are several different cosmological models, but the, the two main are the standard Big Bang theory and the inflationary cosmological model. Both of them affirm that the universe had a beginning. There are multiple lines of evidence supporting that from observational astronomy, the redshift evidence that the, the light from distant galaxies is being stretched out, indicating that the galaxies themselves are moving away. There's the evidence of the cosmic background radiation. There's been additional um, observations about anomalies within the cosmic background radiation. They're also explained by, by the standard Big Bang. Uh, on Joe Rogan, I talked about the new evidence that's come in from the James Webb Telescope, which was initially falsely reported as challenging the idea that the universe was expanding outward from a be beginning. But as I discussed, I had, a, I think, about a 14-minute clip that the Rogan people put up where I explained why the uh, 
the James Webb data is actually confirming the picture of the universe we've had of a universe that's expanding outward from a beginning point. I've had two two separate astrophysicists, one at the University of Washington and one at University of California, San Diego, um, uh, uh, communicate with me subsequently to affirm that, yes, you got that right. That's what we astrophysicists think. So, so there's lots of evidence from um, astrophysical and astronomical evidence, but there are also two really compelling uh, proofs or mathematical uh, results based on theoretical physics that are also, in one case, highly suggestive of a beginning, and in the other case, pretty definitive proof of a beginning. This is, I'm referring to first the singularity theorems of Hawking and Penrose and Ellis from the late 60s and early 70s that I think are at least highly suggestive of a beginning. There's a loophole, there's a way of getting around their proof of an absolute singularity, but it involves something that I think has uh, called quantum cosmology, which I think has theistic implications for other reasons. And then there's another proof based on special relativity, uh, the board guth vilenkin theorem, which I think closes that loophole uh, that is left by the, the, the uh, Hawking Penrose discussion. And so you have these multiple lines of evidence and developments in, within theoretical physics, all affirming a beginning to the physical universe, the universe of matter, space, time, and energy. And that's a very significant philosophical, uh, that, that, re, that scientific result has very significant philosophical implications because uh, whereas if you have a, a materialistic or naturalistic worldview, that worldview affirms the eternality of matter, that matter and energy are eternal and self-existent mm -hmm. and do not therefore need an external creator. But if the universe itself had a, a uh, came into existence a finite time ago, it raises a question of causal origins. And it requires a cause which transcends the physical domains of matter, face, space, time, and energy. And then uh, for, for that and other reasons, I think, has a kind of... Um, uh, the, the the causal profile of the entity which would be sufficient to produce the universe is one that starts to look an awful lot like a transcendent creator, the creator of, of theism. Um, and so um, that's that's the way I read the situation. There are newer cosmological models that have been proposed. There was a oscillating universe model in the 80s that, that kind of went by the boards as there were both... Uh, thermodynamic and observational considerations that counted against it. Uh, Sir Roger Penrose has formulated a newer version of, it's a kind of oscillating universe model. It's called the cyclical conformal cosmology. I, I write about it in the epilogue to the, the second edition of my book, the paperback edition, uh, and show that it's, um, it, it, if true, it has huge unexplained fine tuning problems that it raises. And so it's kind of a out of the frying pan into the fire type of thing. Uh, but it's it's also a highly speculative model for which there's no direct evidence. It's it's uh, a, a, a yet another attempt to circumvent the obvious conclusion of the experiment or the uh, observational evidence that we have. So I think there's a pretty strong set of indicators that the universe has a beginning. And if you want to get around that, the, probably the best way to do that is to invoke something like, like quantum cosmology. But that actually didn't get around the beginning in the end. And it also portrayed the universe as arising from pure math, which is very weird. How do you get matter out of math? Uh, when you think about that, you realize that math is conceptual and the concepts exist in minds. Even some of the proponents of quantum cosmology, such as the uh, physicist Alexander Vilenkin, uh, have said, well... Are we then, if we're if we're invoking these prior mathematical laws as the explanation for the origin of the universe, are we are we really saying, therefore, that the universe came from a mind? So I think I think the the materialists are in a box. I think there's there's different ways to try to get around it, but the the newer cosmological models invoke prior unexplained fine tuning, which suggests a mind. Those that are trying to get around uh, um, the finite nature of the universe, the the attempt to get around the cause the, the evidence for a beginning with quantum cosmology, I think failed on its own terms and had its own theistic implications if true. And uh, and so I I, I I lay all this out in the book as there's kind of a cosmological trilemma. Pick your, if you're a naturalist, you got to pick your poison. And and you're, there, there really isn't a good naturalistic explanation for the origin of the universe. If you enjoyed this conversation, you might also enjoy the Wisdom Society. 
Join today, support this channel, invest in yourself, grow in faith, connect with believers from around the world, click the link in the description to find out more.